I don't know exactly how you can trust anybody in any aspect of life in a world where our financial system in my generation is like it's almost failed us. So everyone's kind of just like YOLO, like I'll just go all in and and just go for it. If you're a young person, you have appetite to take risk. You can take big risk on something that has a potential high reward. You work hard, you earn money and time is exchanged for value. Where attention goes, money flows. I sold my company and I put everything into crypto. And I was like, how, like what's going on? I've, I've, I've found like the infinite money glitch. Welcome to BitGet Show. I'm your host, Ugar Usi, and today I have Will with me. We're going to deep dive into crypto insights. Mm -hmm. And Will, like the industry of being influencer or key opinion leader and all this like a marketing channel of people trying to sell and generate revenue through the content they produce and the platform they built eventually. Mm -hmm. I always have this question, like what is the difference between influencer and key opinion leader? Well, that's a good question to ask because I've actually been thinking about that like a little bit over the last few weeks. And my interpretation is that influencers were come out of like the Web2 space, like created their own lifestyle, show, showcase that lifestyle to a vast like, amount of people. And then from there, like became the influencers with key opinion leaders, especially within like a, a new space like crypto or something that's educational. I feel like instead of showcasing a specific lifestyle, it might be more of like a knowledge or a skill that they're showcasing. But essentially, they both do similar things. So they both create an audience and then monetize the audience in some way to like have a lifestyle. So for the specific influencer, if we use that example, they might be into fitness or traveling or something like that. And then they will showcase the aspects of their life that revolve around the things that people are interested in. So maybe that's traveling or the fitness, and then either sell a course to help people to do to achieve the same lifestyle or to get like partnerships and go with like a travel company to help people travel to destinations or clothing companies to help people I don't know buy like the clothes that they're wearing or like you live the same life as them and the same with key opinion leaders I feel in the crypto space specifically because that's obviously why we're here um they like have their knowledge base that they either share for a price at, at a time with their uh with their people who follow them or the people that they, they like lead with their key opinions or they like will work with a institution or exchange or something like that. They so say like a bit get and they'll be like, okay, cool. In association with bit get, we're doing this. And then they move their community towards um, a key company or a player in the game institution. But like in my opinion, if you are a leader and you claim that you have the you are a key opinion and mm -hmm. you have an opinion about something, opinion should be unbiased, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you have the opinion that correlates with the people who pay, mm -hmm. does it even become an opinion? Yeah, I think that's a fair thought and a fair comment. And this is something that I've discussed a lot. It's like when I created my channel, I didn't create it to make money off anybody. I didn't create it to make any sort of anything. I just started to share my views online. And as my views like my views being my personal opinion. And as that started to gain traction, I looked into more of like what people do in positions of influence because I'd never been in that sort of position before. But when you get to that position, you then spend a lot of your own personal time, all your personal time, it's my full-time job, giving my opinions. And for that, there is probably some, or should be in any line of work, some sort of remittance. And so that's where I think that maybe it's hard for the lines to be crossed, but people monetize themselves in different ways, I guess, as they go further on their journey. Do you think you're an influencer or key opinion leader? I don't really like to associate with either of them because I find it like a strange concept that a lot of people look up to me in terms of like my knowledge when it's just something that I've been learning myself and sharing my journey along the way. I never set out to be either of those things. I just set out to share my opinion. And as more and more people like my opinion it grew into something that that I'm still learning as I as I go along as we as we all are so I wouldn't really like to bracket myself in either I'd, I'd like to say that I like to give my opinions and that's where and that's where I am and then if people choose to follow them or think that they're valid or like them then that's how like we've got to this position I guess you mentioned Sorry. that you're trying to share your journey right mm. uh how, how did you end up in crypto that's a good question and 
if we want to go from like the very start, I'll give it like a day one. A compact, <laughs> yeah. Genesis <I'm>, wallet. <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. Um, I actually came in from like a the opposite end to a lot of people. A lot of people come into crypto through finance. They will find crypto through like a financial route. Like maybe they're like um, ex-bankers or traders or someone in the financial industry. Me personally, I came in through esports, so like competitive gaming. Uh, I did sort of have always like a weird background like compared to other people I never followed the traditional nine to five um I did go to university and I studied physical education and school sport I wanted to be a teacher but it was only because I liked sport it wasn't because like I want always wanted to be a teacher after that I actually um started a company in the UK importing products um from China eco products and distributing them around the UK to small retailers at the same time like I, I kept this like habit or not habit but like I guess passion like behind closed doors because I always wanted to be like a cool a cool kid at school I like, didn't want to show my like true colors I guess um, and I was like gaming a lot behind closed doors but not really talking about it this gaming took me from like nothing to competing in tournaments competitions and earning like multiple thousands of pounds when I when I was actually competing the streaming through that we used to play like competitive games where people would say I'd play you for some money you'd say okay cool let's say but in this example, pounds, I'm, I'm from the UK, say like five pounds, you put five pounds down, I put five pounds down, winner takes all. And through these like forums, there's a lot of people, as you can imagine, who are just inside all the time, like we're banging forums, we're like on websites, like nailing each other with messages, challenges, this sort of thing. And one time someone's like, oh, I'll bet you like a Bitcoin or like, I'll bet you a bit of a Bitcoin. I was like, what, what's a Bitcoin? Like, I don't even know, like I, like I had no interest in finance really at the time. I knew you had to work to earn money to live but no interest in like the base of finance. So when I started to get more of a concept with Bitcoin, I was like, this is just really cool. Like it was kind of similar to the esports worlds I'd grown up in, in terms of like the mi- like now looking back on it in terms of the micro economy and the world that we use to like trade virtual assets and stuff. And then now I was actually trading like this real money in, in like game scenarios. But again, like I knew nothing about like the cyclicality of it, the business cycle, nothing like that. I just literally bought some Bitcoin on Coinbase and then bet it with someone else, then like won, lost some, and we accumulated more. And I was like, what else can you do with this? And then that was the days where like exchanges, the only real exchange was like uh, Bit, Bitfinex maybe, is that it? Maybe it was Bitfinex. I can't remember the exact name of the exchange, but I actually found the account on that not too long ago. And it had a bit of Bitcoin left in it, not much. But like I just took the Bitcoin over there and just like played around with trading. Like I had no idea what I was doing. The monetary value of it didn't really mean anything. And then the 2017 cycle came around and then like I had like maybe a few hundred dollars and it spiked up to like a few thousand. And then I was like, well, what's going on here? And then it was like 20,000. And I was like, whoa, like I'm the best trader in the world. Like as I got into it. You almost got a whole Bitcoin there. Yeah. As yeah. per the numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, well, I, I cycled it into Litecoin, like not, not knowing anything. And Litecoin had like a 200% day or 100, 170% day. And I was at work, I was working in like, so I had this business and I worked as like um, in a cafe as a barista as well at the same time. And I was, went to the toilet at work, I looked at my phone and it's like double, it's like it's worth double. And I was like, how, like what's going on? I've, I've, I've found like the infinite money glitch or like something. I was like blown away. Like didn't even really think about anything of it. I was just like, what, like what's going on? And then that led me to think that like there was a way in the society that I've grown up in is like, that people are making money differently to the way that I perceived money to be made. It was like, you work hard, you earn money, you work hard, you earn money, and time is exchanged for value. And then that really changed my perception on things that there are other ways to create to create value. But I didn't understand any more than that because it then went down in, in the bear market proceed, like preceding that to like, I, I still made profit on it, but more luck than judgment. It wasn't, I wasn't like trading or making any profit through trading. I like say put a few hundred pounds in and say came out with like one or two thousand. So it, it was just a weird journey. Then I left it, nothing. And I was like, because I didn't want to touch it. I was scared of it. All this sort of stuff. Watch you go to 20K. Watch you go down to two. Almost like panic. Just an observer. Yeah. And then hype started to come around again. End of 2018, like starting in 2019 to the middle of 2019. I was like, mm, like, this is something I need to look at. Like I've got to, I've got to do this. Cause I always in that time period, I'd save some money from the company that I've worked at. 
And I always felt like I was this close to doing something good all the time. And then I just stopped this close and just stopped, like didn't quite ever take the, the leap into whatever it was. I told myself, if I ever got the opportunity again with crypto, I'm all in. And I sold my company and I put everything into crypto in 2019 and started making content. And from there to now, it's just been an absolute roller coaster. As we talked about before, it's like I wasn't here as someone who's supposed to be a key opinion leader. I just saw the first cycle, maybe stupidly took a chance on the second cycle. And then all of a sudden, like I'm here and it's my full time career and it has been for like three years now. And I do all sorts of different things from like asset management to portfolio analysis to write, writing macroeconomic newsletters, having those published for some of the biggest like um, private publishing companies in the world. So like GMI, Global Macro Investor for Al Powell, has got a private facing uh, publication that goes out to sovereign funds, wealth funds, family offices, and all this madness of a journey has just come from the that's guy. A, that's a great journey. And I like that gaming start point mm. because I also used to work with one of the largest uh, gaming console developers. And today, crypto industry with all these NFTs in there and play to earn mechanisms, what is your take? Like, what is the difference between crypto gaming and uh, competitive or like a leisure or entertainment gaming? Mm. Because I remember when I was a kid with my brother, we used to, you know, grow the players and sell it to the other people or you will go and hunt the gems and you will have some tool and you'll go sell it in a marketplace, but actually with money transactions and that kind of it. Logic was always there. Mm. Like, what is different today's crypto gaming than actual, you know, entertainment? Well, I think we're actually like a juncture where we've not quite progressed into like a gaming economy within crypto. I think that, as you just talked about there, there's definitely a market for it. Like, in if anyone who's experienced games before, and the easiest example I can give is like a John Wick skin on Fortnite. So you play Fortnite, there was like some skins that came out that ended up being quite rare and people then now sell their accounts just to get that specific skin. And as you talked about, you trade, you traded your time for a value in some cases, so like RuneScape might be an example for some people in that. But right now within Web3, I don't think we quite have that same crossover yet. There's people trying to build that and people rushing out products. And to be absolutely honest, and this, I don't want to throw shade at anyone specifically, but like everything that I've seen is just a pretty rubbish game. Uh, they just create a game, they token grab, push the game with like content creators or whatever. And sometimes nothing happens. And sometimes you just have like a not very engaging game to play. But I don't think that, and the, on the other side of that, you have the gamers who are quite scared of the crypto space and the like NFT space in general, who sit there like, oh, what's that monkey picture doing for $110,000? Or, or like, I don't know, 70,000, like what it is now, like, what what's going on there like i don't want those pe crazy people coming into our industry and like tarnishing my name like i'm not a monkey i'm not a monkey picture display profile picture sort of guy i'm like pro beast 212 who shoots everything in call of duty so i think that that juncture is there but the possibility and this is a point i'm trying to make is if you see the development in gaming so far in my lifetime it's gone from something that people just did for a complete leisure to creator economy of people who stream make youtube videos and all these different revenue streams and competitive games all in one and there is another step outside of that and i think that that's when we start to find a fair value for attention when gaming companies can find a fair value to, for attention that's when the web3 and, and gaming intersection will cross because that i think there's a huge market for it just no one's cracked it yet because i remember i used to work on a very famous game that i remember that people all over the world because the launch was delayed. People were taking vacations mm -hmm. to play that game day and night for five days, for seven days, and so on. And people were actually paying a couple of hundred dollars to acquire the game to play, right? It means there are people who are ready to pay for mm -hmm. a really good game. And on the other end, because all the play-to-earn games I came across in crypto industry, they're pretty boring, very simplified gambling mechanism the same mm -hmm. way you explain you know someone puts the money i put the money winner takes it all and then they cut take the some kind of a cut mm -hmm. and then we saw all this you know uh housewives and uh retirees in vietnam sitting and playing the game and paying taxes all this 
the play to earn environment became like a token utility, but there's no actual utility because mm. no one enjoyed the process. Mm. I, th I think that like along that perspective, that just nails exactly what we've just talked about is like you were in an industry where people were paying a lot of money because they wanted to play a game. In this, it's like you're trying to pay people to play a crap game, but there's nothing, there's no, they've not met yet. When a good game meets a tokenized economy that's token tokenized well, for example, like I play Call of Duty, that's the game that I like to play. If we made some sort of mechanism where me as a younger as a young adult, where I was when I was younger, could use my time to use my skills to create a gun or like take the gun. They say you need 500 kills with that gun. It takes a certain amount of time. If I can then take that and make that transferable to somebody else for value, for actual money, there's a, a great revenue stream for young people. And then that, I think that incentivizes more people to play the game over time. I think there's obviously a lot of different routes you can take that specifically, but that's just like one specific route of where and why I think gaming could be so big in our future. It hasn't quite got there yet because we haven't seen either a triple A game embrace it or good mechanism for people to like have longevity in a game. The tokenomics are normally quite bad. But do you think, in my opinion, the triple A games don't want to embrace it because they don't want to share the revenue with mm. you know the masses. And also I'm sure they're very afraid to bring wrong audience who are only money incentivized to kill the entire game because games have their own communities the same way we always tell like oh like a crypto is all about community actually mm -hmm. all good games are about communities mm -hmm. right discord was there for gaming in the beginning twitch is there and all these channels were there and also i think crypto gaming and play to earn gaming the developers are so much incentivized by making the tokens and making sure the token always goes up and just incentivize or like a buy the attention with the money that they're not interested to make the good game. Mm. And I don't know, do you see any future for the entertainment in crypto? Yes, I do. But exactly what you were just talking about, I can, I can completely see both sides of that argument. Like I think that I get why a AAA game wants to keep their profits in house and won't, wouldn't want to share that. But I think that in realistic terms, somebody is going to crack that um, that process where we like I was saying that that like someone's going to someone's going to crack that. They're going to get both right, and then what's a triple A game has got to compete then in some way because they're going to get left in. Uh, let's say one triple A game does it well, and they have some sort of revenue sharing program. It's going to do what it, exactly what it does. What we've talked about just then. It's going to incentivize two communities to come together a crypto community and the gaming community are going to cross together and it's going to it's going to be a powerhouse because it's almost like a financial community and the gaming community all crossing into one and if they can then incentivize somehow I, I haven't cracked this that's why i'm not a games developer but there's always ways to take royalties or do profit sharing or anything like that on a small scale that would incentivize people who may want to do it just for entertainment but then oh why would i instead of just doing two hours in the evening for fun i'm actually quite good so maybe i'll do four hours because i can actually earn enough for my for my dinner like or or to order a pizza by doing this so then i'll do four hours and then oh my friend's now getting into it because you saw that i got a free pizza so now i can do six hours or ten hours and but then like, wasn't all this the same kind of a narrative when all, all nft hype came it was like all artists coming together i don't know liberation uh you own now your art and narrative was there but in reality mm. why did nfts fail yeah i think that that is a sort of similar overlap i think with gaming specifically it get i'm going to go on to nfts after this but it gives people something to do like gaming is something that people do no matter about the money anyway so if there's a money aspect there it probably increases participation and the amount of time people play gaming i mean nfts are different in another way in my opinion i think nfts can be argued for a lot by a lot of different like stances obviously you just talked about art specifically if we're using art for an example and a, a pfp if we use high-end pfps as well let's just use board ape or crypto punks or whoever you want for an example as a as a pfp collection i really do get the argument of why they are valuable 
I think we're moving into a more and more digital and online online world where we as human beings walk around with mobile phones 10 years ago we didn't we we live in a metaverse not not the metaverse buzzword because people don't like that but we can get on that's a different topic we live in a more and more digital world essentially is the point and in that digital world we are still humans humans like greed they like to be fancy they like in the in the real world we like rolex watches gucci bags ferraris why do we like them well just because we can like because we can do it if you can do it you do that's mainly the reason so if instead of 1000 people who might see a rolex watch in your day-to-day interactions 100,000 people see your profile picture why is that not as valuable as a rolex watch and that's my why it died i think because like everything that has hype cycles it goes up and down but if we look at like the luxury watch market is a great example if we overlay the l- luxury watch market over the nft market we can see that they follow pretty similarly in regards to liquidity and business cycle so when luxury watches are on the way down nfts and people who've made money in that ecosystem like they're on the way down but then when when it goes back up and eth like eth for example here in this crypto punk board eight yacht club um example when eth up starts pumping again and people are rich within the space are they going to start flexing their gains again oh look at my thousand eth that i've made this cycle and as more people come into the crypto space are they going to be competition for that i think they, like because like this um exclusivity and members only mm. places this concept are, are not new right there was so house for almost ever mm. from like 80s right and then ferrari club is there almost all these luxury cars uh rolls royce has their own app and their mm. own community but all these products deliver some sort of a value mm-hmm. while in nft art space it was quick flip mm-hmm. like no one wanted to buy board ape for you know to benefit from the whatever benefits were there uh it was more of a like okay i want to buy it and i want to sell it as quickly as possible to make as much gain as possible Mm -hmm. and i think like that money incentive was the core no one actually believed in the product because if you stop a rolex wearer or ferrari driver they could talk about product and they become ambassador of the product because Mm -hmm. it's not only about oh people see my rolex it's about all the values and branding that was evolved and built forever because i'm a rolex lover and it was the culture right the mountaineer would wear them it works under the water i could go on and on and on and Mm -hmm. on and on it wasn't just making me another cool person it just has extra value the same thing if you talk about your ferrari you can go forever yeah while what why you bought a board ape yeah and i think that you've nailed one aspect of it there which is a really important thing is like time like one thing that we haven't experienced and that we can't prove now is time because rolexes as you say i don't know when they were like when the brand originated or when the ferrari brand originated but they've had all that time to grow their community they will have had ups and downs in their career uh, or their long- the longevity of their cycles and the same with nfts like how do we know that this cycle or in cryptocurrency or this next liquidity cycle that's that's starting to uptick now in terms of like global finance how do we know that's not going to be even bigger for nfts we don't and the other thing to to pray on to that point is if we look at board apes now for example yes they've come down a lot in terms of usd value but they've hit a floor and that floor has been anywhere between like 28 and 33 eth and that's still quite a lot of money and to say on one side of the spectrum you could say oh yes yeah, it's, it's a big drawdown from where it was from the start but crypto always draws down massively like it, it is an asset but class. don't you think that entire narrative like actually killed it, the technology itself and what it could do for bigger and better world yes and no i think that's a really good point because i think that we're going to see a lot of um new things from nfts and crypto specifically like ticketing identification health records all these sort of things when they're brought on to like the blockchain are great like it's a great use case for nfts and as what has happened with crypto it's it's all speculation based like if we look at bitcoin if we look at eth if we look at any any crypto why does the asset go up in value it's speculation that in the future it could be this or it could do this and it could do this because but it's not actually touched our financial system yet and i think that's the same with nfts yeah okay we're talking about the specific pfp 
um, use case. But if there's all these other use cases, when you're thinking about all those places, all those things, they've still got to be made and created. Right, then it's just an imagination to start with. And then the celebrities jump on it and they start talking about it because everyone else is. And it gets this big parabolic run up when the technology underlying has yet to be developed, but the ideas might be there. And then you go into this drawn out bear market and everyone says, oh, that's dead. Bitcoin, 95% drawdown going to zero. Oh, the next cycle does a 3x the all time high. We can't say whether NFTs will or won't do that because we haven't had that time in the market to really realize that. Sometimes ago, I read this news about an artist that took the money from the museum to create an art, mm -hmm. and then he just sent two empty frames and named the art like a take the money and run. <laughs> and entire <laughs> NFT discussion reminds me of that. Like everyone tried to monetize as fast, as quickly as possible, from celebrities to luxury fashion houses, mm -hmm. from Jack Dorsey selling his first tweet and mm -hmm. everyone else in there without actually, you know, caring because it was like, okay, how can I monetize it right now, right here? Mm. And when it comes to ticketing and all the beautiful things could be done, mm. I'm yet to see any event that has a NFT ticket, including, mm -hmm. including crypto conferences. Like mm. we all are coming together and talking how our world could be a better place with the blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. And still you go to any crypto event, any crypto conference, it will be QR codes, it will be emails coming. I haven't seen any NFT tickets, have you? No, but I do know that Ticketmaster are the biggest distributor of NFTs in the world. I can't remember exactly how many they've given out, but they've been basically using NFTs as tickets on the back end, and people don't really know that yet. So Ticketmaster have been basically airdropping people NFTs and using them as their tickets. I've not personally used one or experienced it, but there is that. That like, why do you think like a crypto industry fails to embrace the technology that we are preaching so much? I think it just takes time to build. I think that if we actually take a zoomed out perspective of what crypto is, it's highlighted right now, actually, with the, the recent price action of Bitcoin, but I'll get into that another time. It's just a, few, a room of like a few individuals. If we look at the, the population of the world, there's a few people, smart people, some smart people, building things but things take time to be built and tested and then used and then they take time for that to be argued into why it should be used in real life when people don't understand the system and then that then has to be again then promoted out to people to actually use it it's exact thing we're talking about like if we look to the financial system there's so many like clunky problems with the financial system but it works it's been working that same way but this is an upgrade like it's it's a provable upgrade if we're not using a specific crypto or anything, if we just use the example of blockchain technology, like that's an upgrade on the system. It's been around for 10 years now. Why aren't we using it? It's because people are scared of change. People, it takes time to build. It has to be stress tested, all these sorts of things. In regards to specifics with ticketing, I don't know because I'm not a dev. Like I, I can't work that out. I, I can I can only just open up my iPhone. Like I, <laughs> I don't know. A very fair point. Uh, in previous, you know, like, Two, three minutes before you mentioned about in crypto, everything's about speculation. Mm. And I follow you on Twitter and I see your tweets. And I think like a crypto Twitter was a, one of the main driver of the speculations. Mm. Like all these feuds happening, you know, inside the news, some screenshots running around. Like how, the, where does the crypto Twitter get its news from? Like where do you get your news from? Uh, so this is the exact thing that I wanted to talk about just right there. And as to why the price action right now is going down in crypto, I feel like crypto Twitter specifically is just an echo chamber. Like one person with credibility or something like that will maybe say something to someone else, then they'll say it to someone else, and they'll say it to someone else. And because there's like, as there is in the real world, there's a few people at the top who have the information or whatever information and they give it out to someone and that spreads like a wildfire. And I use the real world example of like, if you're Amazon and you own like the New York Times or whoever, owns whatever news journalism platform it is they say something and then everyone says it and i think that's kind of the same in crypto and where do i get my information from a mixture it depends what i'm researching and what i'm talking about i like to i would have prided myself on saying that at some at one point i was probably one of the best researchers of ripple and xrp in the world i was mainly when in my tiktok days and when it was like that i used to get my research from 
Ripple's publications or looking at like SBI holdings who were shareholders in Ripple, what their recent actions were, where they were investing, this sort of thing. But when it's like a more general crypto topic, I'll just have a look at someone who I personally respect online, what they're saying, have a look at the articles that publish, who they're published by, and then either regurgitate it with, with my own spin or give my opinion on it. And that's where I get my information from specifically. But I can see how things catch fire in crypto because it's an emotional space and there's say like 2000 KOLs maybe with, with enough reach to do anything. And they just they either gr jump on the same story or I don't know how else they would create a story specifically. Cause like in an influencer web to kind of a lifestyle mm. sellers, you'll go and you'll say that I uh, see that, Oh, someone is promoting, I don't know, this is kitchen widget. And you will know that it is promotion. Mm. Most probably they will put as tag at, tag it as an ad and, it will be obvious and it's easy to, you know, to determine even without an untrained eye. But I noticed that in crypto industry, all these key opinion leaders or most of them would have your interest, either interest in that holding of particular asset mm -hmm. or in that partnership that pays them through affiliates or different pro products and programs. And this m monetary value that is out there will prevent people to become unbiased mm. and they would be much willing even if not to produce the false information they would be much willing to amplify that mm. information to benefit right if i am holding i don't know x amount of crypto asset and i know that someone is publishing a good news about it or a fake news but i don't know we saw how like a SSE's hack happened, mm -hmm. or at some point, like a coin telegraph posted something. Uh, and people end up amplifying it because they directly benefit from it. And w w w like how the average user should, or who the average user should trust, or how to determine who's saying what. Yeah, I think that is a really difficult thing to do, especially in the time that we're in right now. I think that's only going to get harder and harder for the foreseeable future especially with ai coming into the space because you're not even going to be able to know if it is the person who even like even if the person has the best intention whoever it might be and they're completely legitimate they have been so far now with the ai it's getting an even step even harder than that because you don't know if it's even you talking it's someone else the deep who's fakes deep, deep fake fakes you. Are... and so i think that that's a super difficult topic and i think blockchain might be a way to solve that specifically but in that exact example there i don't know exactly how you can trust anybody in any aspect of life in any walk of life and i don't expect anybody to ever put 100 percent weight on anything that i say i'm giving my best opinions but i can always be wrong even if it's i've done the research and all this like i can always be wrong so even people with the best like faith and they're doing it for the best reasons they can still be wrong so whenever you listen to anyone online it's the same with any web 2 company like an investment company for example they might have a big interest in, let's just use Tesla for this example. They have a big interest in Tesla. So they bring like Elon Musk onto their show and they talk about Tesla's new stuff, but they they wouldn't come onto the show and Elon wouldn't say, oh, we had this many cars fail and like ran someone over. You're not going to say that in, in an interview. So I think, again, the lines are really hard line in the sand to be able to find what's trustworthy and what isn't when you're looking online. But what is like, your standpoint like as a content creator as an opinion leader and mm -hmm. we also like i as you already mentioned and i was like reading your research about xrp and like recent days what happened like who was buying why they are buying with lulu and all this case uh how do you like how do you stay true to yourself when you have certain portfolio you got that news whether you want to like you know that monetary that decision could monetarily benefit or not benefit you. Like, how do mm. you, like, or what is it, like a QOL ethics? Because as a journalist, for example, if you go today, one of my favorite publications, TechCrunch, and you read the disclaimer by each writer, they will disclaim all the assets they hold mm -hmm. just for that sake that, you know, they might be biased, while mm. with QOLs, you don't have that. Yeah, I think that's probably a gray area for, like, KOLs in general. Um I think that it's hard not to be biased if you hold a product. I think that's part of the course. And I think people know pretty much what you hold though by what you talk about.
but then they should follow a, a range of people and this is something that i personally do is for example i follow peter schiff and he hates bitcoin like he just craps on it all the time he says how good gold is and every single post that he makes is about bitcoin but i would i'm keen to see what his opinion is then i follow some people who are complete bitcoin bulls and don't like anything else like max kaiser just because i'm keen to see what his opinion is and i know they're biased in their own sense but I know that the world isn't a perfect place. So I just follow him, him and him. And then I'll take bits of their information. And I'll see what lines up and what doesn't. And then I'll try and find my truth. It doesn't have to be the truth because ultimately we don't really know what the truth is. I just take a little snippet from everybody and then make my own decision from there. And that's what I think people in the market should do in general. I don't think you should ever go to someone and be like, oh, that opinion is exactly why I'm going to invest my own money. Like, I don't think you should ever invest your own money off what anything I say. I give my opinion and I've told you why I'm invested. And what I think is going to happen, it doesn't mean it necessarily is. And especially with something like technical analysis, technical analysis is a statistics game. Maybe if you're a good trader, you get 60% of your trades right. That still means you get 40% wrong. I'm not going to say to anyone, oh, get all your money and put it all in this trade. Because I know that that's almost a coin toss, whether you're going to get it right or wrong. You've got a slight odd. That's it, though. It still could all fail, all go, all go down badly. None of us know. We're in this world, as we talked about, of speculation, where we haven't quite made the step into like a dent in the universe or however you want to talk about it. So we are just speculating with our our best intentions, but also maybe our personal te- intentions as well. You know, uh, on your Twitter profile, there's this like a first big sentence. It says like, it's not financial advice. Mm. And whenever like QRLs talk about it's not a financial advice, it reminds me of two things thing is like that knows on a cigarette package saying like cigarette harms your health and blah blah or on uh, when you sign up for any digital tool it says like uh, i agree and you tick that box without even reading i read and agree but like you yeah. don't like in my opinion whoever is in crypto industry and amplifies and talks about it it is a financial advice no i don't think i'd agree because i think it's just like it's your opinion like you can have an opinion on anything and it just happens to be something financial like if i had an opinion on how this water tastes it doesn't mean that the water does taste that way that's just how i interpret it so if i then if i'm stating or someone anyone not just me if they're stating oh it's not financial advice they're just giving their opinion about what they see and what they think like in a world of free speech that that should be like allowed or i don't know like i feel like it's a strange concept because it feels like somebody saying like in your opinion here like or the your discussion is like you shouldn't be able to say that it's not financial advice and then give an opinion on something financial but i don't think that that should be the case i think that you should be able to say anything like you want in general it's just because there's connotations around the fact that it's financial specifically like negative connotations in the world and do you think that's why like crypto people rebranded themselves into key opinion leaders to take yeah. to like a uh, distance themselves from like an influence factor of yeah because i think just as there isn't any like walk of life and any like career in general you have some people who are there just to make money and market off anybody and some people who are there because they love the space or they want to promote or whatever like they want to promote things they're interested in and i think that there is a difference but finding that difference is really tough like even i being in the kol circles like I know some people are genuine. I know some people who aren't and I'm not going to name any names because that's up to them. And it's up for people to find out. Like if, if they're, if they're doing whatever they're doing and you're happy watching it or listening to it or taking their advice or opinions or whatever, that's absolutely fine. Like I'm not one to say this person's an idiot. This person's not an idiot, but in the world in general, the world that we live in, unfortunately, some people are there just to make money and some people are there to talk about things they're passionate about and interested in but we all need to make money somewhere. So that's why the line gets crossed. Like we all have to earn money in, in this world that we live in. Like if everything was free, you quickly see who was interested in the space and who wasn't because a lot of people would disappear, I guess. You know, while in social media, mainly like your opinion leaders, influencer, whoever we call them, they built their audiences, they become a separate channel and mm. they try to monetize. And as you mentioned, like money is the biggest investment. But also there are people who are kind of a, have that influence by default, right? Because mm. they are in a very high positions, like, you know, you're head of SSE or you're Elon Musk and your single tweet can influence many lives mm. and many decisions. 
Like, what is your take on that? Like, why some people have so much power, like Elon Musk and Dogecoin story? I think that was one of the genuine, you yeah. know, mesmerizing stories out there. Like, mm. how he could do with one tweet. That wasn't much about Dogecoin. <laughs> yeah, like, that's a hard one. That's a super hard one because he clearly has influence and as you said because it's so big it, it moves markets when it becomes that size like how do you say whether someone should or shouldn't say something but again i do think that people should be able to say what they want like if elon musk comes out and says look i want i like dogecoin i'm gonna buy it like i think he should be allowed to he's just a person in that sense i understand yeah, that like he he's the richest man on the world he could buy all the crypto out there yeah. and most probably he would have <laughs> some money left <laughs> yeah in the corner no, I, I completely i completely <laughs> he's get not that. just another man right <laughs> he's like richest man on the in the world <laughs> yeah and i and i think that's a fair shout and but i don't know how you could discriminate against someone for being rich like that's the opposite end of the spectrum isn't it so it makes it a hard a hard one to regulate i wouldn't want to be the person trying to regulate that because i can see it from his perspective too like if he's just someone who likes doing something like why should he not say what he wants to say just because honestly i didn't like the fact that you called this a discriminating because <laughs> of rich i don't think like that's how discrimination works but like you do macro analysis mm. and how much do you consider that personal opinion in there by that in of what sorry can you if you do a macro analysis mm -hmm. and how much you consider because how much you consider that richest person and his interest and how he could drive that particular market that's definitely a consideration like for example with doge i, I spoke about this the other day it's like we know that for sure that twitter are making or x are making x payments now like that was released on friday and because of his opinions in the past you could assume that doge would be included in his x payments if it's going to be crypto based so if you think that doge is going to be included and it's going to be a new payments application surely it's good to have a position in doge because you know the person of influence who's as you said talks about doge doge price goes up so it's definitely something to take into consideration it's something to take into consideration if like vanguard or blackrock go out and buy shares in something i'd take that into my investment considerations as well like let's say in this example like coinbase blackrock and coinbase have the usdc partnership and so you have to take that into consideration when you're looking at companies because of the way the world's run when you're looking at companies oh how is this company ran who's the investor in it it's the same kind of like when you're using i don't know if you would call elon musk a kol but he is a key <laughs> opinion leader like but just like the pinnacle so you have to take that into consideration, but you can't, I don't know if you can even say this either. You can't build your whole thesis around it. But I guess in this case, you, you almost can like, how else is the market going to be like, no one else can move the market like that. So you have to take it into consideration. Now, like we talked about how the news, you know, generates how market is speculative, how people, how much pe power people have in this market. Like, what is your recommendation for an average reader who doesn't do, I don't know, technical analysis, mm -hmm. who doesn't follow a million people, who doesn't have eight hours to be on the social media and who is, are like a passive consumer, but they still want to make some responsible financial decisions or I, informed financial decisions? I personally think that there's a few different categories to, the, to answer that question. And those categories depend on net worth, dependence. So like if you have children um, and also like your expenditure. So if you are younger and you can take more risk, I think that in the world that we live in, that's becoming more and more digital every day, I can only see us becoming more digital over time. Whether that means crypto goes up or not in value, I don't know, but there's definitely the chance that crypto could start to engulf other asset classes over time and if that is a possibility that possibility doesn't exist anywhere else as far as we know like this coffee mug or a brand or whatever people use the example of like amazon or facebook or google these are huge brands within the legacy finance crypto could engulf the whole of legacy finance because it's just a new rail for things to be able to move around we've never seen that opportunity almost in human history 
So if you're a young person, you have appetite to take risk, you can take big risk on something that has a potential high reward. If you're an older person or have dependents, still have it as an aspect of your portfolio, because if it, even if it's just a tiny aspect, you can then, let's say you're invest, you've got a property, you've got some gold, you've got some equities, you've got some cash positions and some treasuries. If you balance that with something in that portfolio that's got high risk, again, you have that time that you have that space to um, maximize your upside reward, and then you can rebalance into more stable assets is if and when these things happen. But I feel like in a world that we live in right now, my personal opinion on it is that monetary system is debasing. Like we can see that by even just take the debt of the world, like all of the US, for example, $33 trillion of debt, that debt that has been created it has been spent somewhere and if that debt is going to continue to expand which it will do until everything collapses one day but i don't think that's going to be for a while but let's leave that to another another day if that debt continues to expand it's more money coming into the system the debasement of that currency if everyone's financial balance sheets are expanding at the same time like like the uk or the or the the bank of england's balance sheets expanding you can see that in asset prices in general houses going up in value whatever they're fixed assets so on something that has the pr most provable fixed asset supply, so like Bitcoin or something that literally cannot go up past a certain amount of, of supply, if the denominator that you're measuring that in can infinitely increase, then over time in a world that's going to get more digital, the numerator should suck in that liquidity and in relationship to the price should, should go up in value. So for a young person or an older person or someone with dependables, I think that everyone should have an aspect of it in their portfolio. I think if you want to take more risk, obviously have more exposure. But to answer the question specifically is what you said was, how should they invest? I don't think you should ever take on more risk that you can you can risk like to lose. But what I do think you should do is understand that if you understand the world and that we're getting more digital, you would be a fool not to have some aspect in your portfolio because of the fact that there is an exponential potential upside to this like if there's something what, that could offer you exponential returns it should be somewhere in your portfolio you just got to decide where and if you're not like in, interested in finance the easiest way to like save or or do anything in that space is to just buy some and every month like dollar cost average and just leave it there no matter whether it's going up or down in price if you want to take it a bit further than that buy more on on red days and buy if you do it once a month, if it's gone up from the last month, maybe you buy like a fraction less that month. If it's gone down, maybe you buy a fraction more. That way you might be able to maximize profits more, but everyone should have some sort of exposure, in my opinion, in a balanced portfolio. But like we talk about like a generic investment portfolio right now. Like what do you think that what's the best way to structure a crypto portfolio? And think about like someone who just starting now. Someone mm -hmm. doesn't know much and doesn't have you know doesn't want to gamble everything in one go okay well i personally think that it's all a gamble like we talked about it's all speculation and bitcoin's the king now but who knows whether that's going to be the thing i mean it's more likely that it's going to continue to be the king forever now with the recognition of the institutions but whether that stays number one or eth or something else takes over i don't know like no one knows so the if we're looking to play completely safe the first thing I always tell everyone is just to read about it because some people aren't interested in tech. If you're not interested in technology, it's not the place for you for you to be. You've got to be at least interested in tech or finance. If you're interested in one of them, read the white paper of Bitcoin, get a base understanding. And then probably don't stray too far out of the top 10. Like obviously two out of the top 10 at the minute are stable coins. And everything else is further out on the risk curve. The further out on the risk curve you go, the more chance you have of losing it all, in my opinion. Stay with the larger market caps and slowly buy a little bit of them and read a bit more about them as you start to buy it. What I found personally is when I started to invest into things, when I first got into the space, it made me more interested in what the project's actually doing, where it's going, how it works. So then I would buy and then I would read. Whether that's the right way to do it or not, I don't know. <laughs> but it did give me that incentive to then do the research. If you want to, if you do then start to get more involved in the space and you see people like it's easy to get sucked in, like meme coins making 100x, all this sort of stuff, be sensible with your risk management, like keep your main investments in one space. And the space that I would use is a basket of the top 10, probably weighted with less percentage weight in to the, to further down the risk curve you go. So like that, say you're at number seven, whatever that might be, like let's say it's Cardano. If you're invested in Cardano, then maybe that's 
five percent and bitcoin's 50 and eth is 30 or something like that and if you want to degen is the word then have like a few percent of your portfolio to play around with and the rest of it stay sensible because what's shown us so far if history repeats is that the cycles the the top the top market uh, cap cryptos increase in value over time and that's that's just that's historically proven so as long as you dollar cost average you're going to have more than you did the cycle before no matter where in the specific cycle period that you take that reference point from and you were mentioning some risk and meme coins and in my opinions in my opinion i i never hold any meme coin i i don't think like i am that much you know mm. risk adverse in terms that you know i would go and gamble my money but what always fascinated me in meme coins that they never have a product and they never have a utility even mm. though i am a deep believer that you know as if you are claiming to be a currency there should be a way to transact with it because money currency has no value unless you transact with it cost i don't know 10 or 20 cents to print a hundred dollar bill right but you can buy more things yeah. with that but still meme coins as a phenomenon they exist even in a bear market they did miracles and it was mainly fueled by qls mm. and social media like where do you sit in that meme coin market now i'm gonna get a lot of hate for this i am gonna get a lot of hate because i I know that a lot of people who follow me and, talk, and like my my opinions are very like specific for like financially driven about like legacy finance and how that's going to progress going forwards. I can see the other side of it as well, and I can argue a few ways for meme coins. It's not something I have much of my portfolio in, but I do know that within crypto, and we see this every cycle, where attention goes, money flows, and like that starts where I said we see it every cycle with Bitcoin. Then it moves to large the larger cap altcoins. And then as people have made money there and they try and make money again, they chase that higher return. The money flows, the liquidity flows into smaller caps and they can gain more percentage. That happens with meme coins because if you use the mid curve meme, for example, you have the Jedi on one side and the pleb on the other side. And in the middle is 98% of people who don't make the, who don't make any money on it, but the 2% uh, either side or the 1% either side are people that make money. And then the example of a meme coin, let's use like whiff, like dog with hat from Solana or like your doge. Like, why do people buy that? As you said, because KOLs push it. But realistically, like, some people buy it because they just think it's cool or funny. Like, oh, I like that meme. We live in, like, a meme generation. People like the Doge meme or, like, the Pepe meme. Pepe, like, flew up because people like the meme in general. And they're just like, oh, I'll put a couple of hundred dollars in there. And, yeah, some people think, oh, I could make a thousand X on that. And that's why they buy it. But then they kind of become, like, a community because then they then do the same thing you were talking about earlier with the bias that they have oh, I've bought some Dogecoin. And I know that even if they don't understand they're doing this, if they then try and promote it to other people that they know, like maybe it's your friend down the, who's at the pub, you go, oh, look, I bought this dog token. You should buy some. And indirectly by doing that, you're increasing the people in the community and the amount of holders. And then obviously the amount of demand for the same amount of supply and the price over time goes up. Honestly, like I always talk about like meme coins because they, they spread like a coronavirus and... The way it happens, usually they would drop a lot of coins to famous wallets mm -hmm. and then they will do a lot of free drops and until people, or like a very cheap drops, until people are really, you know, they become an ambassador themselves mm -hmm. and they go around because it's like a, even not sophisticated, maybe like a less sophisticated version of a building a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. But I also think there's one other thing that meme coins do really well. They normally have a, a boatload of supply. So, you know, if you don't have a lot of value, as in like to say dollar value, you might have like 10 million Dogecoin and you can be like, I've got 10 million Dogecoin. And like that means a lot to some people because there's a lot of supply. It looks like you've got a hell of a lot in your wallet, even though it might only be worth $10. It's also exciting for those people. And it's in a world where our financial system in my generation, it's like it's almost failed us. So everyone's kind of just like YOLO, like I'll just go all in and and just go for it so that's kind of like where that there's a huge like cocktail of things that all spiral into one and where that and again it's like goes to that attention thing like where that attention goes the money flows because of all those reasons it's like going to vietnam and becoming a billionaire or millionaire <laughs> because the money has too many zeros but yeah exactly it doesn't necessarily make you a millionaire yeah that's, ex that's exactly i it. think like that's a very not funny but like a little bit 
heartbreaking, you know, mm. phenomenon. Why I'm saying this because I do know, like, I come from Azerbaijan, and I, especially in that territory, in that area, CIS communities, also Southeast Asia, you see that people always have this narrative that push to them that, oh, something will become $1 worth, and they will always think that when it becomes one dollar i'll become a millionaire and like holding that much coin mm. kind of correlates with that future hope that most probably mm. will never arrive mm -hmm. and i think when that constructing a portfolio and thinking where to put your money people should be very careful mm. especially like how much you know they play i i definitely agree and depending on who it is that's up to them where it is like how much that might be but the reason that i said it should be included as a part of your portfolio if you want it to be is because you know and I know as well there's a lot of attention in that space and it's easy to get sucked into like if you're a new person in the space and you say let's just say you're completely new to crypto and you had a thousand dollars if someone said oh I've made a thousand x on a meme coin you might be like oh like I'm gonna have a chance I'm gonna have a go a thousand x I'm gonna put a thousand dollars into it I could become a millionaire I think that's the maths I don't know maybe not um <laughs> but like I could become a millionaire but that's where people get caught on the wrong side. And like you said, we need to educate people to say, cool, let's stay towards the larger market caps and use a slight percentage of your portfolio to gamble on that. Because it is just a gamble, like on meme coins. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have exposure to it because on the opposite side of that, how do you buy a meme coin? If someone's never even used like Etherscan or like Uniswap and, Met and Metamask wallet, like it has an educational side to it as well as the gambling, like introduces people to the system and then... All of a sudden, they've done three things. They've created a MetaMask wallet. They've used Uniswap, and now they have, uh, and, and they've exchanged a token on those, on those, on that Ethereum network. And that introduction of people may never have done anything in the financial system before. Like they might not even understand how like the banking system works. But they've made three quite complex transactions, and that's how you educate some some people into the space as well. So I think it does have some. Uh, educational value as well because those people will probably some of them will stay in like some will get wrecked and go to zero but some will be like that was really cool what i did there like i'm gonna buy another one or a different one and as long as they've got the money to lose that's fine but that's why you use a tiny percentage of your portfolio to do it perfect thank you for the show today will and i was your host we got us at bitget show where we discussed about speculations qls and how even the money you lose is all about learning yeah thank, thank you for you. having me everybody